Today is the second inquiry into our non-surgical cosmetic procedures inquiry. Um, for those of you who don't know, we established the um, Beauty, Aesthetics and Wellbeing Group um, sort of towards the end of last year. And, and originally we started it to celebrate all things beauty, not just the inquiry we do in our, but we, want, we really want to uh, promote what the industry does in terms of contribution to the economy, employment, um, what it does in the charity sector, um, the well-being aspect of it, the, the whole spectrum. Um, we wanted to celebrate this as being really important and something to be celebrated. And along came the issue of um, cosmetic surgery and boy did we open a can of worms and as a result of which we're all sitting here and I don't know what worms you've got to bring out but no doubt they will be interesting because it's been an absolute roller coaster of a ride. Um, today our session, oh, I'm Karen Harris, I'm the co-chair, Judith Cummins is um, also a co-chair, I can't see who else is on here now, Peter Dowd is, on, is, is also parliamentarian and he is the, uh, the treasurer of the group. I saw Alberto Costa, but I think he's gone now. Is Alberto gone? I can't see him on you now, but Alberto Costa is also on the group. Um, there are other uh, parliamentarians involved uh, who are all really interested. And in fact, over the uh, not connected to today's inquiry, but over the last few days and in the forthcoming days, you will see a lot of activity from us around the, um, the way the beauty sector is being treated in the COVID uh, lift uh, or the lifting of restrictions on COVID uh, mm -hmm. in the UK and well right across the UK um, and uh, you will be hearing us be quite vocal on that you can anticipate some speeches today and tomorrow on this very subject so without further ado I'm going to introduce you to our speakers today we've got Alexander Woolard who's the chair of the Cosmetics Practice Standards Authority and where are you Alex and uh, I can see you Alex Nice to meet you, thanks for joining us. Uh, Clark Caroline Lara, CEO is the Director of Quality and Standards, National Hair and Beauty Foundation, and I can see Caroline at the top there. Diane Hay, I can see Diane, who is the Chair of the National Occupational Standards Steering Group on Aesthetics Treatments for Harvia, and Vice Chair of the Beauty Professional Apprenticeships Group at the Institute of Apprenticeships. John Curran, I can see John at, the, at my screen on the bottom and is the former president of the British um, College of Aesthetics Medicine. Leslie Blair, who's been on Welsh radio this morning. So, Boreda, Leslie, Shudiki, uh, chair of the British Association of Beauty, Therapy and Cosmetics. And Sharon Bennett, hi Sharon, uh, chair of the British Associ Association of Cosmetic Nurses. So, I would like to thank you all for coming. And I'm going to start with Alex. And if you could give five minutes, Alex, on where you are and all this, um, and I'll come to you each in turn, and we'll uh, we'll ask questions after when when we need to ask questions. So over to you, Alex. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. So I'm I'm very grateful for the opportunity to give input to the group and to be involved in this overall process. Uh, as you said, I am the chair of the Cosmetic Practice Standards Authority, and we are a not-for-profit charity. We're associated with the professional organizations in the sector, BAD, BATPRAS, BARPS, but we are independent. We are in unpaid, donating our time pro bono. The remit of the CPSA is many-fold. Primarily, we provide the standards to our sister organization, the Joint Council of Cosmetic Practice, or JCCP, which underpins their registers of both practitioners and trainers. Secondly, we gather data from the registrants on adverse incidents and complications. And thirdly, we horizon scan to monitor for new treatments that are appearing on what seems like an almost weekly basis, looking for those that are frankly harmful or have no evidence to back up their claims. In response to some of the issues raised in the KIO review, we created a set of standards for the non-surgical cosmetic sector, putting patient safety at the fore. We consulted all interested parties across the industry and medical professions to create a consensus opinion based on risk profiles across five overarching categories, toxins, rejuvenation, lasers and energy-based devices, fillers, and hair restoration. The standards cover training, practice, premises, and the environment. 
What was very clear in that process was that the industry needed to address not just the technical aspects of non-surgical procedures, but a broader development of the professional aspects of practice, such as audit of adverse events, appraisal, mentorship, and continued professional development. Key to that was the production of a risk matrix that stratified the levels of training and competence required at each level of the HEE levels of practice, and critically, how individuals could acquire more skills and progress up that ladder. I think it is vital that we dispel the assumption that the involvement of the medical profession in this process is an attempt to exclude the non-medical community. We are only interested in patient safety and we have a deep appreciation of the possible pitfalls of substandard care. If we can verify that people achieve the necessary competencies in both their technical and overall practice, then they should be encouraged. It is those that are not engage, engaging in this, or those that refuse to recognize the broader concerns that are the rogue traders and need to be curtailed. Suggesting that managing your practice safely is a matter of recognizing when you can send the complication to A&E with plastics cover is not acceptable. The data collection is a crucial part of our role. And I know this question has previously been raised by Nick Dowd, and I'm afraid I was not satisfied by the responses from the previous respondents. The lack of data and poor outcomes in this arena has always been an issue. It has been used as a justification for the lack of regulation in this area, and without mandatory registration, it will never be possible to collect the data. Without a denominator, we will never have the body of evidence to make the changes we need to in this sector. To gather that data, we need a mandatory register to enable its collection, as we have already got in the medical sector. Currently, the reporting is negligible. There are two opportunities that we at the CPSA believe could have the biggest impact on patient safety in this sector immediately. One would be a mandatory system of registration of practitioners, and two would be making fillers prescription only. Currently, there are practitioners in the sector who are scrupulous and those who are not. And that is not necessarily because they are medically trained or not. However, the regulation of the sector is nothing short of sporadic. Some are under the remit of a regulator, be that the GMC, the GDC or the NMC, which enables their license to be revoked should they practice inappropriately. For a significant part of the sector, there is no such recourse for poor practice. A mandatory register would enable and protect the practitioners that are providing a good, safe service, something along the lines of a British kite mark. The lack of regulation of fillers is something that totally baffles us. The risks are clear, significant, and arguably even greater than for botulinum, which is prescription only. And making fillers a prescription only medicine would remove a significant danger to the public. Thank you. Thanks ever so much, Alex. Um, that was really interesting. Um, I'm now going to go to Caroline Laracy, um, who we are familiar with, but Caroline, pretend you've never seen us before. And, no worries. Um, over to you for your five minutes. No, that's fine. Um, my name is Caroline Laracy. I'm Director of Quality and Standards at the National Hair and Beauty Federation. Um, I've been involved in hair, beauty and aesthetics for the last 20 odd years. I think for a start, I think it's important to outline that, you know, beauty therapists have been providing aesthetic treatments, but formerly called um, advanced practices um, with national occupational standards and qualifications since 2012. And we were part of the Kiog review. Um, we fed in um, as equal partners as part of the framework and we're very happy with the outcomes uh, from the HE report um, as part of that. Going forward from the report, we were very much in favour of supporting an, an organisation going forward to provide uh, structure towards the standards. Throughout the development of, of the process, the beauty sector have, has always been on board. We've had several meetings over years supporting a development of standards and qualifications um, in the sector, which I know Diane Hay will go on to the new development of the national occupational standards as part of that. There's a plethora of extremely good practice within the beauty sector with highly qualified and trained reputable practitioners providing excellent services to their clients. 
these practitioners along with ourselves are very keen to drive up the standards to ensure that anybody who does not have appropriate skills or training or experience will not are allowed to provide treatments. Poor service and outcomes reflect badly on the industry as a whole, not just the individuals involved. So it's extremely important that the beauty industry is recognised as part of the solution to any of the problems within the sector, rather than the problem itself. We feel that the beauty industry and the medical professionals need to work together to seek a solution to raise the standards and protect the safety and well-being of clients. As part of our work, we have been looking at developing qualifications that would support both beauty and medics. We actually produced ourselves a guide to qualification and age restrictions, which clearly recognises the routes from beauty therapy into aesthetics. This guidance has primary authority approval and is widely used by environmental health officers as a national bank mark, benchmark for qualifications and training within the beauty sector. When anybody enters into the beauty sector, there is an extensive period of training. A typical learner will spend 15 to 20 months on the level two qualification, then progressing onto a level three qualification, which takes a further 18 to 20 months. If they specialize in going to level four and level five treatments, that's a further year and further year on top if they're looking at advanced aesthetics going forward. So that's five to six years learning within the sector. We strongly believe that beauty therapists and aesthetic practitioners must have full access to appropriate qualifications and treatments as we've uh, detailed within our guidance. The variety of aesthetic treatments and the demand for these treatments has fast moved. But in the last year, we've had, you know, further qualifications developed, which I know colleagues in this meeting today will go through in further details. However, some of these qualifications that are there for the advanced treatments have been unfairly regulated and restricted. We feel there should be regula regulated qualifications that are available for all practitioners, whether they're from a medical or, or non-medical back background. These should be provided by regulated awarding organisations. There should also be a method of being able to have an assessment for so people who are currently completing these treatments. And that could be a one day assessment um, as part of that. We are aware as a sector there is a growth in short courses. And we feel that this is an issue that should be addressed. But this is across the whole of the beauty sector, not just aesthetics. There needs to be less discrimination and more equality across the board for practitioners entering into aesthetics as part of that. We feel that a way forward is by looking at the premises and providing guidance for uh, looking at premises going forward and a regulatory framework that can be done as part of that. We think there should be a licensing scheme that comes, covers the pre pre uh, premises regarding infection. There is a similar scheme in Wales. We think that all man, uh, practitioners should have mandatory first aid training, including anaphylaxis and handling complications. There should be clear medical oversight that can be viewed. CPD should be mandatory and appropriate qualifications and training can be checked. This can all be done through local authorities, through their lo local government licensing process. And we do feel this is the way forward. We do believe that the beauty industry and medical professionals can work together to pull this forward and provide a solution to our sector. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. That was really useful. Diane. Oh, sorry, we're gonna, now we're going to go to Diane Hay. Thank you, Diane. I was really introducing you then, John. Diane, over Thank to you. you. Thank you. Um, colleagues, I concur with, with what has already been said um, this morning, this afternoon even. 
Um, I'm a practitioner in the sector of 32 years and like Alex take on pro bono work in regards to standard setting across a number of settings and Habia chairship of the National Occupational Standard Steering Group is one of those roles. So today I'm here to represent Habia in that capacity. Habia are pleased to be called to provide evidence to the APPG for beauty, aesthetic and wellbeing sectors as the government appointed standard setting body for those in addition to the hairdressing and barbering industries for the development of the national occupational standards. National occupational standards, if you haven't worked with them before, in the experience that we've had, are quite misinterpreted and misunderstood in purpose. National occupational standards aim is to provide information and clarity and it will provide answers to the APPG's inquiry regarding the current national framework for standard setting. National occupational standards or NOS as they are known are statements of standards of performance an individual must achieve when carrying out a function in a workplace together with a specification for the underpinning knowledge and understanding. They are national because they can be used in every part of the United Kingdom where their functions are carried out. They are occupational because they describe the performance in a particular occupation and in this case non-surgical cosmetic procedures covering the suite of modalities that Alex referred to earlier. They are standards because they are statements of effective performance which have been agreed by a representative sample of employers and other key stakeholders in this arena approved finally by the UK Standards and Frameworks panel. In the case of this suite of standards for elective non-surgical cosmetic procedures, Habia collaborated with many colleagues and key stakeholders from CPSA, JCCP, professional industry bodies, environmental health officers, healthcare colleagues, liaised and communicated with the Department for Health and Social Care, healthcare regulators, our own employers and included all aspects of healthcare professionals and insurance, insurance providers to form our expert working groups. NOS provide, as I've said, UK-wide demand-led evidence-based benchmarks of competent performance based on the sector demand statement which is formulated annually from research evidence and in this case in response to the urgent and lacking need for a national standard to be available where there was none. And currently, as we've heard from all three, three of us, no statutory regulation, but a fragmented sector with variable degrees of practice. The NOS addressed the following areas in each of the modalities that were looked at in this round. And this was the second round of modality work for the production of NOS, taking on board new evidence and information to form our thinking. Each of the modalities address the following areas being insurance, premise standards, infection control, age restrictions as they're currently defined in law in each of the devolved nations and these are future proof to reflect the law as it changes. The informed choice and consultation techniques and processes when working with clients and cooling off periods and additionally complication and emergency management protocols that must be in place when carrying out each of these modalities. NOS are not a qualification, they do not denote a level nor do they provide a license to practice. They are not exclusive to any group of individuals or professionals and do not provide a mandate to practice. They are used to inform and by awarding organisations, higher educational institutions, professional bodies and organisations as a collective benchmark from which programmes of learning and qualifications can be developed. They can also be used to support the role of our environmental health officers and enforcement action with local authorities to execute the duty of care we all have under the Health and Safety at Work regulations. Again, where there is currently a lack of regulation and in cases of litigation, as the national benchmark of performance, these can be used taking account of current legal frameworks. Habia support the call for the formal requirement of all practitioners, irrespective of entry, to be appropriately qualified in the re re relevant modality and from the current suite of elective non-surgical cosmetic treatments that they provide. 
and those in the current scope and at the correct level. Again, we are watchful and visit our annual uh, demand statement with new and emerging modalities. With the correct rigour and scope in support of public safety, statutory regulation and a pathway supporting and recognising the professional status of those providing these elective treatments to maintain and raise a practice standard across the arena for all professionals. We also support the call for the hygiene and premise standards enforcement checks to be enhanced in each of the geographical locations where these are carried out and licensing be mandated as it is currently variable. I would like to thank everybody around the table for the work that's been undertaken on behalf of the sector and maintaining public safety and look forward to its final recommendations. Uh -huh. Thank you so much. Thank you, Diane. And now we're going to go to John, John Carroll, Dr. John Carroll. Thank you very much, Carol. Um, and thank you for asking me to submit to this group. And my response will probably be a little bit more emotional. Um, I want to say, first of all, my enduring respect for my nurse colleagues. And I know Sharon is here to uh, speak for the nurses, but much of what, which of what I say, I believe, applies to the nurses. And I want to give a big shout out for Karen's members, or Sharon's members, who uh, I've known and contacted during this period and how much they responded to the crisis and came back to the NHS and stood shoulder by shoulder with many of our colleagues as well. Um, we'll never forget that chance and thank you to your group. Um, when I looked at the CV of the people that I'm talking to, uh, I was actually particularly impressed with the co-chair, Carolyn, and the work that you've done in safeguarding the vulnerable. Um, that's something that's close to my heart and I've spent my whole life looking to safeguard the vulnerable. And I assume a key focus of this committee is safeguarding the vulnerable. So I was surprised when I read the website and I saw mention of the beauty industry and words like cosmetic, aesthetic, and even grouping medical people with beauticians. But there was no mention of the drivers of why people seek treatment. And what I want to say on behalf of my colleagues is we're not part of the beauty industry. We practice medicine and we specifically deal with the concerns of a vulnerable group of souls in our society. And I quote uh, Ballant, uh, the godfather of uh, psychological medicine, when he says that nearly all patients presented to the doctor have a psychological element to them. And that comes from 1957. And that has been proven and evidential um, over many studies and many looks at this sector. But that's not my problem. My problem is if we as a group cannot accept that this group of vulnerable people exists and needs medical care, how can we expect to safeguard them? So it's a difference between what we've heard people talk about clients and patients. And if I could feed back in the very statement or the admission of looking at that on the website would seem to me to trivialize their deeply felt anxieties and physical problems. They are real, it is evidential, and recognized at the highest level, the European Court of Justice. So we've put in a submission, I'm sure you've read it, but I want to touch on three areas of your invitation for evidence. And, and this is not criticism, it's it's just what struck me. I was asked to look at this yesterday and uh, I pulled myself away from uh, medical practice um, to do this, but it struck me that perhaps the wrong questions are being asked. So you, you ask, what are the current qualifications training a medic or non-medic aesthetic practitioner must obtain to administer Botox? For me as a doctor, that's an incredible question. Botox is a prescription only medicine. It's unlawful. Against the law for a non prescriber to hold stock, dispense, or prescribe. Why? Because it can kill you. It's in the data sheet. The Human Medicine Act isn't there, the 2012, isn't there just by chance. It's there to control people in the prescribing of harmful medications. The GMC, the GDC, the Nursing Midwifery Council forbid us as doctors and prescribers 
for prescribing it to, for third parties unless we do a face-to-face -face consultation. And it's a very good reason. Karen, it's there to protect the public, to safeguard the vulnerable. The same question and the same thoughts go through my mind with medical device. And I've heard Alex speak elegantly, and uh, one of the things he talked about was dermal fillers. Of course, this is a misnomer. Um, most hyaluronic acid fillers are placed deeply in the face, in the subcutis. It's nearly impossible to get it into the dermis. Anybody that's ever cut into skin will know that. It's deep, it's into the subcutis, into the fat, and it down to the periosteum. And because it's at that level, there's a risk of vascular occlusion, of necrosis, of allergy, we've heard about allergy. But once again, that's not my problem. My problem is thinking through how do you manage the complications? The complications need to be managed immediately. If you inject into the side of the head and you accidentally have retrograde embolization into the ophthalmic artery, you can't send that patient up to hospital. You don't have time. You need to have hyaluronidase there, you need to have sildenafil, you need to have steroids, you need to act. That patient will go blind. If a patient has an anaphylaxis, do you ring for an ambulance? Or do you have adrenaline? And these are dangerous drugs. And they are controlled by the Medicines Act. They're controlled by Medicines Act because they come with risk. But how can you safeguard anyone by giving a medical device like hyaluronic acid when it can do harm and you cannot manage that harm? Threads. I love a drink. I work with four plastic surgery colleagues, two dermatologists, three GPs, and seven advanced nurse practitioners. Not one of us use threads. Why? Because it's a surgical procedure, complications are high, it needs surgical skills to remove the product if it goes wrong. And once again, medicines are required to deal with infection. Ask yourself, are you safeguarding the vulnerable by encouraging non-medics, mutations, to undertake risky surgical procedures, which most doctors fear? The second area that concerned me was a statement that it's unregulated, and yes, I have read the report, but for those of us in the medical profession, it's a cliche. As healthcare professionals, we are regulated. We've got the GMC, the GDC, the NMC, the CQC, the RQIA, HIS in Scotland, the Medicines Health Regulatory Authority, the ASA. I have on top of that, I've got BCAM. I've got yearly appraisals of all my work, regulated uh, obligatory complaints procedures, 50 hours minimum verifiable CPD and it's all measured against good medical practice set out by the GMC. Revalidation and relicensing every five years, 360 degree patient and colleague feedback. And that's the level that we should be working at. Why? Because it protects the vulnerable. And then there's another layer, the courts. I think people dismiss and uh, they don't look to see how Patients, not clients, patients can take redress when things go wrong. Yes, they can complain to the GMC, but every one of us, you and myself, and you as parliamentarians, you have a duty of care, and I have a duty of care. And that duty of care is predicated by a standard of care that sits under that duty of care, and that sets the standard of which we're expected to behave. And we've seen that in Parliament in the last term when the disappointment that many of the public had by that standard of care falling in, in the behaviour in Parliament. And I'm sure none of you were part of it, and it was a very difficult time. And good luck to you in the future, uh, future Parliament. <laughs> a very difficult time. But when, when we are put in front of a court, we can be prosecuted and there can be compensation for medical negligence because we have that standard of care. 
and we have to abide by that standard of care. When you come outside the medical profession, you start to look at civil problems and you start to look at uh, civil litigation and it's not the same standard and they do not expect the same standard of care as you expect of medical profession. Well, I'm going to wind up now because we, we need to move on to the next one. Okay. Well, I'm going, well, I'll say very, very quickly a couple, a couple of little things. The BCAM are working with the General Medical Council for uh, level seven postgraduate training as a basic requirement for independent uh, medical practitioners. No junior doctor ever works alone on supervised because it's not safe and we think we should raise the bar. In terms of, uh, um, can, I make, can I make a slight uh, response to, uh, um, to the co-chair statement on opening medical clinics, if you don't mind, and how it would erode the public confidence in the beauty industry. I can understand you saying something like that, but I'm pleased to report to the chair that the public have recognised for what we are. Or actually, in so many cases, the same people dressed in PPE, putting ourselves in harm's way, who clapped, who they clapped every Thursday at 8pm. Yeah. And we dressed up again in the same PPE in response to their concerns and um, with medical trials and helped that vulnerable group, just like the rest of our colleagues. And if we didn't, they would have the right to say to us, who are you to judge us that our needs are less worthy than others? Who are you to belittle our physical, psychological and psychosocial concerns? Right and call it purely beauty or vanity. They don't need prejudice, they don't need discrimination, they need equitable access to healthcare, delivered by healthcare professionals who can manage any remedial emergency in a safe medical environment with, within the law and with the governance of the regulator. And if you really want to protect the vulnerable, apply the laws that exist, make medical devices a prescription only medicine, and confine practice to healthcare professionals who can legally and professionally manage Thank you for giving me that. No problem. Thanks, John. Over to you, Leslie. Unmute, Leslie. Unmute. No. Done. Sorry. Be careful where you wish for, Carolyn. Usually people want me muted. Anyway, so hi everyone and thank you for everyone who's spoken so far. Um, very enlightening uh, and a lot of the things that I was going to say have already been covered. So I will try and not repeat uh, what anyone else so, has, um, people have said already. Uh, my name is Leslie. I'm the chair of BabTac and SibTac. I am an active beauty therapist and I have over 32 years experience. Uh, at BabTac, we contribute to a number of campaigns highlighting the critical need to ensure the safety of a rapidly growing clientele out there, who more often than not, um, as confirmed by a survey we ca carried out last year, believe the beauty industry and these high-end non-surgical cosmetic procedures in particular are already regulated. Uh, we are a non-for-profit organisation and we uh, also do some pro bono work for the good of the industry. Uh, I worked alongside Diane with the National Occupational Standards, I helped with the JCCP, with the APPGs etc. I worked beside um, Caroline and Diane in various meetings so we do try and com contribute into the good of the industry as well. We have absolutely no doubt that provided a beauty practitioner has completed a recognised fit for purpose training and achieved an industry standard regulated qualification that they are well qualified to technically carry out a number of aesthetic treatments. However, some serious concerns still need to be addressed regarding the other aesthetic modalities. Firstly, due to the lack of regulation in the beauty industry, there is no enforcement of what training must be completed and very importantly, no accountability if anything were to go wrong. I feel the biggest issue we have is the market is saturated with short courses and one day training that is not fit for purpose and there is no regulation to police this. In addition, there are many courses that cannot possibly be delivered effectively and safely in such a short period of time, for example, advanced aesthetics. However, saying that, I do feel it's very important to highlight the importance of short courses and training in our sector. There is no doubt that short courses have their place in our industry, that's for sure, due to the fact that we are an ever-evolving industry and we need to update our skills and undertake regular CPD and short courses, and short courses are an ideal way to do this. However, they must be viewed for what they actually are. They are CPD, 
the continual professional development. They are not a standalone qualification. Generally, I would say view these as a certificate as attendance, not the only knowledge to carry out a treatment. You must have underpinning qualifications or knowledge or skills before you undertake any short course. But unfortunately, as an industry, we have organisations and insurance companies accepting that one day certifications and attendance um, pieces of paper, uh, they are allowing individuals that hold these to practice in modalities that they do not have enough robust training, knowledge or experience in, in and thus potentially putting public safety at risk. Secondly, managing any complications of these cosmetic procedures needs to be available immediately and on site. Due to beauty therapists not having prescribing powers, they are not allowed to legally administer any of the antidotes, regardless of how much training they've completed. Obviously, if they have prior medical experience or prescribing, that's a different matter, but I'm talking about the general beauty therapist practitioner that is out there. It's really, really worrying for us, and we hear all the time that there is some training providers that are delivering complication management training to non-medics and making them believe that after a very short training, sometimes only a few hours, that they are qualified to administer the complications management medicine. And furthermore, they are giving them access to this complication management medicine from, um, from themselves. They are putting them in touch to, uh, to get the the medicines. Finally, as I touched on a few moments ago, while medical practitioners are held fully accountable for their actions and decisions and can be struck off the medical register if they do not act responsibly, there is no such accountability currently for the beauty industry. A further concern is that whilst botulism toxin legally must be prescribed by a doctor or, or a prescriber at the very least, Dermal filler, which is perceived to be far more dangerous, is not a prescribed device and anyone can buy them online and administer with absolutely no medical oversight. So there are significant safety concerns with both procedure, premises and the product. It is our belief uh, that, um, that any of these procedures should have medical oversight with them. And I totally concur with John's comments on the PDO threads. These should only be carried out with someone with a surgical background. It should not be allowed to anyone else. I've spoken to many plastic surgeons over the years and they, they say that it's a nightmare, that a lot of their work is fixing people's bad work with these. So we need to stop anyone who doesn't know what they're doing doing these. It's very alarming that more or less anyone with no underpinning knowledge or surgical experience can go and train in this modality. In some instances, training is only for one day or less. This is yet another example of what, why we need some sort of mandatory regulation or registration out there. The problem is, and we discussed it earlier about beauty therapy and their levels of training, is that not everyone has this three, four and five year training. With the inception of a lot of these short courses that are out there and available to everyone, we have a lot of people in the industry that are doing a, a few days training and thinking they are a beauty therapist and then jumping on the aesthetics bandwagon and being out there performing aesthetics treatments uh, and I do not have the proper experience to be doing this. As again we discussed, this is not only a, a problem regarding aesthetics, it is a problem in all of beauty that we do need to address. I'm digressing, sorry. Uh, these critical factors have highlighted the need for a more regulated approach across the board from all factions and stakeholders to achieve the ultimate goal of public safety and protection with a focus on the following key areas. We must educate the consumers so they are best able to make an informed choice when choosing where to have the procedure done. Provide consistent regulated licensing of products, equipment and premises for those procedures that are carried out nationwide provide fit for purpose training and mandatory insurance requirements and to introduce mandatory registration for any practitioner performing advanced modalities ensuring their accountability. Thank you. That's me. Thank you Carolyn, that's, that's me finished. She's on mute, she's on mute. All right, okay. I'm chairing a, a meeting mooted. I'm so sorry. Thank you so much, Leslie. Uh, now over to Sharon, and then we'll open up for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure. Um, 
Um, and it's been very insightful listening to all of you um, professionals talking. Um, as, as chair of the British Association of Cosmetic Nurses, which is currently um, the largest professional association in the UK's independent medical sector, um, we have a thousand members. Um, we have been looking very closely, as you can imagine, certainly over the last um, month or so, um, on the sector and the division of the, um, the, 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 and the language, in fact, of, of of, of what is being used at the moment. We have, there's a um, discrepancy in languages, medical, aesthetics, cosmetic, and it's caused much confusion in, in the sector, I believe. Um, but I think there is a very clear distinction between um, aesthetic, cosmetic, and medical aesthetic or aesthetic medicine. And I think that differentiation is very, very important. And it, it, needs, and it certainly seems to have been a little bit more clarified by government um, last night um, with the, open, the, the permissions for the medical aesthetic community, which is the doctors, dentists, nurses, to go back to practice, providing they follow a medical model. And I think a medical model in this case is exceptionally important. And I'll talk to it about a little bit about that. But just so I can go back, the practice of, and a little bit of history, the practice of aesthetic medicine um, is a medical process. Um, and therefore, in our opinion, in the BACN opinion, it should only be practiced by regulated medical professionals to reflect the legal position which safeguards the rights of the patients in law. Medicine, nursing and dentistry exists for one reason only, and that is to deliver excellent standards of health care and health improvement to patients and the public. And patients, therefore, must be safeguarded in every aspect of their physical and mental needs. And government must ensure that the workforce of today and tomorrow, practicing medical aesthetics, do so in accordance with the reasonable standard of medical care, skills, values and behaviours at the right time and in the right way, as is enshrined in statutory legislation. Not to recognise this undermines the law of the land and places a significant burden on patients who must suffer society and the healthcare system that has to pick up the pieces when complications set in and resources are needed elsewhere. Um, so the practice of medical aesthetics is derived from pretty well established an element of the specialism of, me of plastic reconstructive and aesthetic surgery and it's evolved and developed in other medical disciplines such as dermatology and only medical and nursing practitioners can practice within these specialisms and medical aesthetic patients require optimum levels of care from the initial time when a patient requires a consultation to the point of aftercare due to the risks um, that can lead to complications. And we do believe that there's a, currently patients' lives are being put at risk due to the fact there is a worrying trend to align medical aesthetics practice to beauty. And, um, um, and unfortunately, far greater emphasis is being placed on the cosmetic result rather than on the medical significance required to safeguard the public. Um, so, um, we do, we do believe that the regulation of all non-surgical cosmetic procedures within the scope of medical assessment should not therefore be confined to a given set of treatments which reflect a beauty many, but rather constitute a level of care um, which is commensurate with, with the care patients undergoing medical aesthetic treatments require. So this is, is includes things like um, a comprehensive consultation, um, assessment, skin analysis, which of course um, I'm, not, I'm not taking that away from beauty experts and they're probably better at skin analysis in many ways than, than I am, but infection control, life support, anaphylaxis, informed consent. Informed consent is key because one has to understand not only the, the treatment itself but the whole medical journey and, that, and the appropriateness for that particular patient um, medically. Um, ethics, medical and psychological assessment of patients. Um, and Anatomy applicable to medical aesthetic practice, which of course can be learned. Um, dermatological knowledge commensurate with health and skin, um, because of course, as John was mentioning, if, if anything is missed, if we, if a, if a, a nurse or a doctor um, misses perhaps um, a dangerous skin lesion, um, then then we would be up in front of the regulator. Um, I think if at the, currently, if a beauty therapist missed a dangerous skin lesion, then nothing could be done. Um, and the management of complications which is a, is, is a very complex um, situation at the moment. So patients 
Um, patients who are seeking medical aesthetic treatments may have a number of underlying conditions and diseases when they present. And these really, it's very important that we can, um, as medical professionals, be able to understand those and, um, and consult medically and properly. And I think this is something that's only achieved by, um, by having um, a, a medical or a nursing qualification. I think that is not going to be able to be taught in um, um, any vocational um, course. So going on, the provision of patient safety and health must be respected in accordance with Article 3 of the Human Rights Act so that patients who are not subjected to substandard degrading treatments by unregulated operators um, who do not re respect the rights or the needs of the patients um, and the complications only present really to a qualified practitioner um, um, when the complication has arrived. So attempts often, um, likely as not, the injecting practitioner um, may have failed to de demonstrate that appropriate advice was given. John mentioned that um, a little while. Um, and the result is often significant tissue damage and disfigurement and substantial cost to the patients. Um, and dermal fillers, for example, are um, a classic example of the most likely complications we are going to see that are serious. Um, botulinum toxin, although prescribed, is, does have less um, um, challenging complications that we would need to, to see. So I would suggest, again, only a registered healthcare professional can consult, assess, manage and treat patients in this respect. Um, in terms of um, the KIA review, I noticed in um, um, one of your Thing is, you know, why didn't, why didn't, after the Kia review was published, why was the industry essentially left to regulate um, qu um, qualifications and standards by government? Um, I suspect that was probably financial, but actually, one of the very important things that has been completely missed from the Kia review of cosmetic intervention, um, and two recommendations, 3.17, was that the committee believes that anyone prescribing fillers or performing other potentially harmful non-surgical cosmetic procedures should be accountable to a professional regulator and the, and the only professional regulators in this instance are the NMC, the GMC and the GTC um, and they believe, believe that the recommendation was a reasonable and proportionate and aligned with the principles of better regulation. Um, the other recommendation, recommendation four, was that all non-surgical procedures must be performed under the responsibility of a clinical professional who has gained the accredited qualification to prescribe, administer and supervise aesthetic procedures. Um, and I think this is a very key part of um, what Jim John's um, argument in terms of prescribing drugs. Um, um, in terms of prescribing, going on to prescribing, um, Remote prescribing and supervision is a key factor in all injectable um, treatments if patient safety is to be maintained um, with a, in, within a framework of practice that meets legal and regulatory parameters. Um, and it's commonly understood that through explicit statutory regulated statements and implicit regulated guidelines that remote prescribing is, is um, not acceptable for cosmetic medical treatments and therefore um, appropriate access to medicines which supports both safe and legal practice is necessarily limited but imperative. Um, and um, even though the prescribing practitioner may delegate treatments they prescribe, they are required to maintain overarching responsibility for the welfare of the patient and they must have a face-to-face -face consultation, which I think is um, um, probably a very difficult thing to do um, um, and even to incorporate that. And I would suggest that if anyone was going to be prescribing um, the medication for a non-healthcare practitioner, that they would have to be in the same premises. Um, the standards of education and qualifications um, are, um, there's a huge lack of agreed standards for aesthetic treatments and it's bedeviled the sector for many years, um, but it has been changing recently in the framework of standards published by the JCCP and CPS CPSA and its competency framework. Um, was linked to the previous work undertaken by HEE. And whilst that's welcomed, um, we, the BSN can't support the recent attempt by the beauty sector to use national occupational standards. Um, it notes that within this framework, there's no reference to medical training, and that the treatments at the highest risk level have been downgraded from the HE recommendation of, of level seven to level six. Sharon, can I ask yes. you to wind up now? Because yes, I will, I will indeed. Um, but um, 
I ha always have a lot to say on these issues, um, but um, I would draw the attention to the British Standards Institute, which has a classification of aesthetic medical treatments risk levels, um, which I was on the committee for, um, which, which talks about botulinum injections, um, pulse light, radio frequency, chemical peels, fillers, and it gives you um, categories, room type risk, risk levels, um, and physical status of patient, which I think is essential. I would, we would love to see um, a mandatory register and, and we strongly feel that making um, a dermal filler um, a prescription only drug would, is, is the correct way to go forward. Thank you ever so much, Anne. Thank you ever so much. As, as ever, we, your talks are so interesting. We always find ourselves listening for too long and not having enough time to ask questions. So the way that we're going to work this is there, there, are, um, well, there are four parliamentarians represented. That's myself, there's Judith, there's Peter Dowd, Alberto Sartaliva. So Alberto's assistant will be sending his questions to Catherine who will feed them to Judith and I. Peter and Judith will ask their questions as and when. Can I just kick off by saying to both Alex and John, um, I really understand the pain of not having, um, of, of people having botched treatments and whatever, but, but I really think there has to be an acknowledgement that, that botched treatments don't always just come from within the beauty industry. Some of the worst practices that I've seen have been medics who are actually doing treatments um, whether, they're, whether they've got the qualification from a girl, I don't know. But some of the treatments I've seen as a result of medics have been pretty appalling. And we, I've actually seen and had a conversation with a medic who is in the business of giving lifetime prescriptions for um, Botox for £50 a time. So I just want to say that, you know, there are good and bad in all sectors and I, we just need to understand. Caroline, can I... Yeah, can, I, Alex. can I just say, because I, I think I, I think I spelt that out black and white, that I totally agree that the scrupul yeah. scrupulous practitioners are not necessarily medics. And I think there are a lot of doctors who are, you know, as a plastic surgeon, I, I see that on a daily basis as well. So I, I recognize that. And that's what I was trying to allude to was that, in fact, I think this delineation between the medical sector and the non-medical sector mm -hmm. is actually becoming uh, a barrier to proceeding. Yeah. In that I think that we have to recognize that there are definitely things at the top end of the spectrum um, where the risk profile is very high and actually they probably should be only performed by doctors but that doesn't mean all doctors having a medical qualification is not a free reign to do anything you want mm -hmm. um, and you know I've trained for 20 years to become a plastic surgeon uh, and there are lots of things that that even some of my plastic surgeon colleagues don't want to do well, so Alex, I think it's not it's not just doctors it's not just and and there is obviously going to be a gray area as we transition yeah. through the lower levels to the higher levels and that five has to be recognized left. sorry we've got five minutes left yeah sorry but it's okay. but but there does definitely need to be a line drawn where below that ceiling you are not deemed to have the okay. expertise to deal with the complications I'm going to go to Judith now Judith next um, I want to ask about product safety um, because we always want to come at this from a consumer point of view, really. Um, I want to ask everybody, I mean, we've heard some agreement today about... Uh, We're losing you. Yeah, you sound's gone, Jude. My sound's gone. Um, Sorry. Yeah, we lost you again, Jude. Oh, you lost you again, Jude. I think, Judith, if you turn your head to the side, we're losing you. If you speak straight to the screen now, we can hear you. I am speaking straight to the screen. It must be my computer. I don't know what's going oh, on. Right, okay. Caroline, I'll come to your office. Yeah, that's fine. Um, Peter, you got a question? I know I've got one here from Alberto, so if you have, I can answer that. Okay, why, why Peter's working out to get the, the mute off? Um, Alberto... I would like to know, uh, should there be a set of standards where, where patients can have treatments, i.e. not in clinics, and in clinics and not in people's homes? So, anyone no. can answer for that? Yeah, I believe, Carolyn, there is, that there's very few people on here would be a fan of, of home treatments, and that is something that was addressed in the standards. Um, I just also want to reiterate that national occupational standards are not levelled. Um, they are a standard of practice, um, similar to the competency frameworks within the JCCP and Habia, JCCP and CPSA all did actually work together and one mirrors the other um, in, in content. 
Thank you. Peter, can I, can I, can I answer? That's already regulated. Yes. John, 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 Peter needs to speak now because we haven't got a lot of time. Peter? Okay. Yes. I, just, I just wanted to ask about uh, international comparators in terms of the regulatory uh, processes because um, it's always helpful to, to get you know, best practice from particular, particular countries and uh, because that, as parliamentarians, we're then in the position to not necessarily go and lift um, other regulatory processes up, but it's helpful for us to have a framework that we as parliamentarians can say, here you are, this seems pretty good. Uh, have you got any views on that? Yeah. Well, yes, yeah. I'm sure you want to talk to you. I would, I would go, yeah, go, go. Okay, well, it was part of, thanks, Alex. It was part of our submission that uh, we pointed out the UK is unique in Europe, USA, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand in permitting non medically qualified individuals to practice aesthetic medicine. And I'm talking about, like Alex, the high end stuff. And um, so, uh, uh, yeah, we're right liars. You know, maybe, uh, maybe that's what I would, the UK wants to be. I would agree with you. I mean, we are we are a, we are an anomaly in that we are we are very unregulated in this area uh, for for almost any other country in the world. Brilliant. Thanks, Alex. So Judith is here, so she's going to get a question before we finish. Um, firstly, thank you everybody so much for um, all the evidence you've given. Alex, can I ask you? Will you circulate your your presentation because I was particularly yeah. interested in what you were saying about um, the regulatory um, aspect and the, the lack of the matrix and the risk register and everything. Um, if, if you could send that to us, I'd be really, really grateful. Uh, absolutely. I'd, I'd be more than happy. I mean, I can certainly take my crib sheet from today, but um, yeah. the CPSA website, the, the, our entire standard matrix is on there, yeah. accessible through CPSA. Crib, or... Yeah, I think your crib sheet from today would be absolutely wonderful for us. If it, you don't it, mind, it, Alex. Just let me know where to share it. Okay. Catherine can keep you updated. Well, thank you. Just question now. Uh, and in terms of, we've heard, I think, quite a bit of agreement from across the industry today. I just wanted to check, are we all agreed from all parts of the industry that dermal fillers should be prescription only and that the, I'd like your thoughts on the standards regarding product quality um, and are they robust enough? But, but, you know, it's in two parts, but the dermal fillers, if everybody can just, if there's anybody that says no, really. Okay, so should we go, should we get the answer, one from the beauty side of life and one from the medical side of life? So shall we go to Leslie for the beauty side of life and um, Diane from the medical side of life? How's that? Thank you. Leslie, you first. Uh, just uh, with the fillers, I think definitely to be prescription only. I do, I do think uh, that beauty therapists should not, and uh, non-medics should be performing these treatments though, even if they are prescription only, because, or if there needs to be somebody there that can help with the administering of the complication management on site, um, in the building, whatever, when they're being done, I think that would be the only caveat to it. Uh, I think we've all um, ascertained that there the, is public safety issue here and the complication managements on both uh, modalities do need to be activated very, very quickly. So uh, I think that there has got to be a medic on site or a prescriber on site at the very, very least. Would, well. would, would, that stop it, would that stop abuse on the internet of people just selling fillers on the internet? Well, I think if it's prescription only, then it would be the same, probably very similar to botulism toxin. Mm -hmm. Now, when I've tried a lot of times for research to see for some articles to see if I get botulism toxin and I haven't been successful, whereas I can get fillers without a problem. And as I said, they are perceived to be more dangerous than botulism toxin. So I think the first step would definitely be getting some sort of uh, prescription only for the, the fillers. The qualification there, the, everyone is lit from the same level. I think Alex put it so eloquently that, you know, it's not only the beauty industry that we have an issue with, it is the medical industry as well. So we need to get that standard there, but the standard has got to include that the person that is administering can either or has immediate access to somebody who can prescribe complication management medicine. I think... Yeah. For Diane, quickly, anything to add to that? Um, no, um, in regards to the prescribing, remote prescribing is, is something that people don't want in any sector. Um, yeah. And um, we don't want as unscrupulous 
wherever background, whatever individual they are, um, this is about ethics and standards, not entry entry mechanism, whether you're a medic or a non-medic and it shouldn't be polarised as such. We have to work together to raise the standards. Okay, thank you, Diane. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. Thank you all for your time. Thank you so much for joining us today. And um, don't forget your notes, Alex. Um, and that was brilliant. Thank you all. Okay, Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.